This is the first thing that I remember. One year, uh, when the wheat had grew over our heads, Mom and Dad, they had set my brother and I down at the kitchen table and looked us both in the eye, and they said, you cannot go out into the fields. I remember asking why, and back then, I uh, asked why to almost everything my parents would say. I guess it was a phase I was going through. You have to brush your teeth. Why? You have to wash your hands. Why? You, you can't push your brother. Why? So... When they said we weren't allowed outside, my, my response was almost automatic. Why? I looked over at my older brother, and he was always one that made me laugh all day. You know, the one that was always being silly and not listening to mom. And he got into all sorts of trouble whenever he could. And he was he was always a happy guy, you know, always smiling. Except he wasn't smiling now. I remember he had this wide-eyed look, and he was unmoving. His hands, they were they were stuck on the table, almost like they were glued there, and they were trembling, and it even made the table shook. He was frozen, staring out the window behind me, locked into that, into that nightmare. My father put his hand on my shoulder and I gently, but with just enough pressure to snap my eyes back to his, and he breathed out the words distantly, and he was deadpan serious. Gary Lowe will see you. The Gauri Low will take you. Then the Gauri Low, he will eat you. Year one. When the wheat grew over our heads, my brother and I shut all the curtains in all the rooms. And if I could see the fields through the window, I wouldn't be able to stop looking. My mom uh, found me one day standing and swaying, dancing with the wind-blown wheat. She tried to get my attention by clapping in my face and screaming my name, but if she touched me, I would let loose a shrieking, blood-curdling scream, wailing and wailing like a screeching kettle. My brother ran to the window, closed the curtains, and I stopped screaming. Then my brother, my mom, and I stood there, and we just hugged each other, crying together. The God Low took three that year. Year two. It doesn't seem possible now, but the wheat had barely begun to burst out the ground one day when the next morning it was just, it was just there. A great sheet of yellow, yellow and gray, a tidal wave of weaving wheat stalks tossed around the wind like kelp in a storm surge. I cried and I yelled and I screamed at the windows and my mom ran to me, hugged me close and whispered, Please be quiet. The God Low will hear you. Shh. Only one was taken that year. His head was left on the doorstep of his house. The God Relo always left the head. Year 3 When the wheat grew tall enough, it began to bend and break under its own weight. It would slowly droop over like an old man with a broken back. Then the morning came when the wheat could no longer hold itself up and it collapsed to the ground. My father would rush into our bedroom, hooping and hollering in unbridled joy like I never saw him from any other day of the year. He would whistle some tune as he put on his boots, and, and he went out into the fields with a grin plaster on his face, and in his hands he held a giant blade, a reaper's a sickle, and with the eerie precision, my father would whip it through the air, decapitating each stalk. I'll never forget the sounds, that, that whipping sound as the blade cut through the air, shuck, then halting as each stalk fell to the ground. One by one, the wheat would fall. Shk! Thump! We called this the culling, the moment when we were finally free. If only for a short time, it would take three days for Dad to clear the whole field. Shk! Thump! Each day, I would sit at the window, watching my father big and strong and cutting down the stalks. No, 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 not, not watching my father, watching the fields waiting for the God Low to get my dad, to take my dad, to eat everything but his head. Each day of the culling, I would open the front door and find my dad's head on the doorstep. I would scream and scream and my mom would come and hold me, telling me that my dad's head wasn't there, not really. It's just in your mind. Still, I waited for the God Low to come. Year four. It was outside my window, the God Low. Pitch black night, I could hear it through the windows even though they were closed. Short burst of quiet, high-pitched grunts. The 
and slamming vicious thing on the front door that shook the floorboards. Concussive waves that were almost rhythmic. The sound had ripped my ears apart from the inside. So loud it felt like it was in the room, screaming into my face. I instinctively hit the light switch and suddenly there was nothing dead quiet in the brightly lit room. A still moment as I took a breath and scurrying noises on the wall outside my room made me scream. In a second, it would be at my window. Too late, I realized this and caught a glimpse of it framed through the clear glass. The God low, monstrous and ancient, an antiquitous terror, sinewy, spiderous limbs hung low in the air crawling, slithering. I screamed and it looked right at me and I have never had a night's sleep without nightmares since. No human deaths were recorded that year, but a herd of wild horses were found slaughtered the next morning. Fifteen eviscerated and decapitated corpses soaking in the surrounding grass meadow in a sickly red. Year five. The weed had begun to sprout and it was like a permanent shadow had fallen over our home. We felt it in our bones. The God Relo was coming. For the first time, my dad took me into town. The town was no more than a single main street, something that you would drive past on your way to somewhere else. We needed supplies, things to last us through the wheat season. Sometimes it took weeks for the wheat to grow tall enough to fall over. Sometimes it took months weeks and months where we'd have to stay inside. The thing I remember most about that visit were the other people. I had only ever saw Jeffrey and his father, you know, our far out neighbors who came around once a year to visit and to trade. Trade what, Dad? Whatever we need. But walking down that small, simple main street, I remember the other people. How they all looked away. When they saw us, they'd avert their gaze and their heads would be down, eyes almost closed. Then I would look at my dad and his head held high and proud, eyes always forward. Why aren't they looking at us, Dad? They're ashamed. Of us, Dad? No, son. Of themselves. He wouldn't tell me why they felt shame. Why they wouldn't look at him. Or me. I should have asked. Maybe he would have told me. I also remember the girl, Sandy walking hand in hand with her mother. She was the only one who looked at me. Bright blue eyes, straight blonde hair down to her shoulders, probably only a little older than I was at the time. Sandy's head was found the morning after the colon. Year six, the winter's snow had melted, revealing the bare earth that would soon begin to sprout. In the weeks that followed the melt, we had lots of adult visitors come to the house. I just remember my parents sitting in the living room with the visitors in hushed voices and constant glances toward the windows where the wheat fields would loom over us. Then my father, you know, big, proud and strong, finally standing up and saying, no, we will never. When the wheat grew over our heads that year, we heard the God reload every night. <laughs> mournful angry call. Sometimes it felt far away, distant rumblings of a passing thunderhead. Other times it was it was in our field. We shut the blinds, didn't turn on any lights after dark. My father sitting on his chair that faced the front door, his huge sickle that laid across his lap. Sometimes the guy reload would slam against the house. Not against the door, never the door. Thundering thrashes on the very foundation, rattling the floorboards. My mother holding my brother and I, telling us to stop crying. Please, you must be quiet. Then one night, human screams cut through the air. The next morning, the wheat had fallen over, and my dad started calling. And one of the spring visitors came to our door. He was on his knees and head in his hands, sobbing uncontrollably. My my father held on to him, and the man just kept saying, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, over and over again. Gary Lowe had taken both his sons. I saw him the next time we went into town, but 
He, he wouldn't look at us. Year 7. The Town Hall Meeting. I was finally old enough to come to the annual event, the only time the whole town actually came together in one spot. Hard to remember everything that was said, lots of yelling, lots of people huddled together crying and screaming at one another. And then my dad stood up and everyone went quiet. Everyone here knows what they have to do for their mothers and their fathers and theirs before them. They knew what they had to do, he said. Those who have decided not to know where they stand with me, no one's coming to help. Then a group of six men in total stood up and said, We'll kill the golly row once and for all. No one cheered and no one clapped. My dad, he sat shaking his head. The six had heavy jackets on, backpacks, guns, axes, and machetes strapped to their bodies. They came through our fields and to the forest that lay far beyond our property, a dot on the horizon where the Gari Lo comes from. The six never came back. One head did. My father found it on our doorstep. Year 8 Our closest neighbor, Jeffrey Farling, or Farling as my dad would call him, came to the house with his son, Jeffrey III, as they did every year after the culling. Jeffrey III was the same age as me, and after the culling, we would visit each other and play as I imagine normal children did when they didn't have to think about the fields. This year, though, something was different. Farling was worn down, eyes sunken, loose skin that hung off his face. He and my dad were arguing in the kitchen. I only remember snippets of it. Farling, we can't keep, Dad. We have to. We're, we're the only ones. Farling, given everything, I have to fight. Dad said, tried to, lost everyone. My dad turned and seemed to sense for the first time that I was there and I could hear them. You know, he stood up and shooed us out of the house. We started running around the yard outside when Jeffrey III suddenly froze in place. And I asked him, you know, are you okay? He whispered back, the God Relo will get me. I shot him a look and we never spoke its name outside the wheat season. It... It won't, not if you follow the rules. I hushed to him. He stood with his back to me, gazing out into the fields. Just like my brother, he said. It was the first time he had said anything about it. Jeffrey II had been taken two seasons before. He turned around and looked at me, looked through me, then pointed a small, bony finger to the horizon. The God Relo will get all of us. And then he walked back into the house. On the day after the culling, Dad went to visit Jeffrey's farm. Farling hadn't come, which was something that hadn't happened in ten years. When he came back, my dad's face was pale, ashen, and streaking with tears. Tears. The man was a walking block of granite. Jeffrey Farling had woken up on the morning of the culling and couldn't find his son. Instead, he found two small fingernails dug into the soil outside the front door and drag marks going back into the wheat fields. Dad held Farling and held him close and tight as Farling kept rocking back and forth on his knees, whispering the same thing over and over. I thought it was okay. I, I thought it was okay. It was, it, was, it was supposed to be okay. I thought it was okay. I thought it was supposed to be okay. I thought it was okay. I thought it was okay. Jeffrey's head was never found. Year 9. My brother's 16th birthday. In the morning, my dad came into our room and hugged him. And my mother cried. She, I could, I could never stand to see my mother cry. But when I went over to her, I realized she was laughing. My father and brother, too, all smiling and embracing and, and laughter coming out of them. They looked at me and must have heard the questions rolling around in my head. And my brother bent down and said, Now I can help, Dad. Now the God Relo won't get me. On the culling, my father gave my brother his very own sickle, and they went outside to begin. 
I stood there on the porch, unable to touch the ground below. I scanned the horizon, looking for the god reload, daring it to come. You can't get them now, god reload. Day two, the culling had come and gone, and my brother and I sat awake in our bedroom. I was asking him all about the wheat in the fields, you know. Were, were you scared? Was it, was it tiring? Will I get my own sickle? He was so tired he could barely reciprocate the energy of my youth, you know, just non-committal grunts, and I went to sleep to the sound of his snoring. But then I woke up to the sound of something else. The room was pitch black, no moon, no light anywhere. Why did I wake up? Something in my dream? I was being pulled across the fields. I was... I was being pulled through the dirt, crying and begging, and I dug my hand to the soil and the nails ripped off. I was Jeffrey the Third. The Garilo had me, and then I remember why I woke up. The Garilo was in our house. I could hear it. I looked over at my brother's bed, but it was empty. His blanket on the floor. It was outside my room. It had to be a dream. I, I was, I was willed myself to wake up. My brother was 16. He was, he was going to be okay. He was supposed to be okay. I so much the courage to get it out of my head. Only then did I hear him. My brother. So soft. It was almost in, in, imperceivable. But that was my brother's voice. I, I followed it. To the open window in our room and, and one that looked out over our fields and, the, and, and one that was never ever open. The curtains were never up. But then they were now. that They were up. And the window was open and I caught my first glimpse of my brother. He was standing at the edge of the lawn. The place where the grass stopped and the wheat began. His back was to the house to me and I could see him out there swaying in the wind matching the movements of the wheat. The wheat! There was a section that hadn't fallen over yet. It's impossible. And my brother was standing right in front of it. But he was he was 16. He wasn't he was supposed to be okay. And then a shimmer and a wave of movement so quick I almost missed it. A thing moved across the air. Shh. My brother's head was taken off his body so quickly that his body still moved. His heads dug themselves into the dirt in the last gasp of instinctual preservation, so primal that it was ingrained into his very bones. The gari low was taking him, and the gari low would eat him. My brother's head, my brother's head sitting up on the grass, the last surprised look of his open eyes staring back at me and then screaming. Mine, my father's too, on the porch in the gari low. Year 10. The wheat wouldn't stop growing. It would, wouldn't fall over. We had been inside for three months. Every morning my father would take a deep breath and open the curtains and every morning his body would be visibly sag. My parents shared a look and I could see the, the fear in both their faces. I asked my dad if this had ever happened before. He just sh shook his head and he hadn't spoken a word since my brother the year before. Then the wheat stalks began to move. On the back edge of the field they shuddered and shook. The gory low. We shut the curtains and turned off the lights and we sat together huddled on the couch gripping each other. My mom was silently saying prayers under her breath. My father just stared straight ahead looking at the picture set on the wall above the door. The same picture he always looked at each morning. 
He would put his hand upon it each time he left to go outside, and I asked him about it once, years ago. I asked him who the group of people were, the ones who all stood side by side with axes and saws and sickles in their hands. There must have been a hundred of them that were standing in front of a forest, the same forest that lay beyond our property. When I asked him all those years ago, all he told me was this, those are my ancestors and, and yours. They took this town and they made this town. That was the last he ever spoke of it. Now he stood up and an unfamiliar look on his face. My mom began to cry and pleaded with him, you know, don't do it. She said, you can't, she said. And my dad simply stood there looking at me and then smiled the saddest smile I've ever seen. I hadn't known a smile could be so sad. He bent down, put a big, strong hand on my shoulder, and he said he loved me. That he wanted me to be free. That he had been wrong all this time. About the town, about the people, about my brother, and about the God Relo. Then he walked out the door and into the field. Watching my dad as he went into the field, I saw something open up. Something great gapping maw of darkness and my mom crying and me crying for my father daddy come back he kept walking did he not see it the, the the black the black father don't go then a hideous screech <laughs> then everything was just gone in one fell motion, the entire field of wheat simply toppled over, and my dad was never seen again. My mother and I waited until the snow fell when the fields were glazed with a white sheet of ice before moving out and away from the only place we had ever known. When we left, the effect was almost immediate. I began to forget about my brother, my father, and about the God we love. My mother never spoke about either of them or the town or any of it ever again. I don't think she forgot, though. Some nights I'd catch her crying to herself. I left her in peace, and she died in her sleep, old, loved, and alone. The next phase of my life was mundane and unremarkable. I got a job. I, I met someone. We had one child, a, a girl. It was when she turned 16 that everything changed. She wanted to go to the country. And for all my life, I'd never been interested in it. All that open space, that open air, and the fundamental lack of civilization. I, I hated the idea of it, but I could never figure out why. Then we drove out to a farm where she could pick apples. I screamed in the car when I saw it. The wheat. Fields of it all around me. I screamed, I screamed until my partner pulled us over and she grabbed my face and I saw her and heard my daughter crying and, every, and just everything flooded out of me. The gallery low, I remembered. We, did, we didn't continue on that day. I, I couldn't move a muscle. I couldn't drive, couldn't talk, couldn't do anything because the gallery low was still out there. It would find me. It would take me. And it will eat me.